All right, how many of you have got a question? I want to get right into the Word today. Are we ready? I want to get right into, are y'all ready? Yeah. Amen. I want to get right into the Word. I want to tell you a quick story. Um, but first, I want to ask you a question. How, have you ever been to like a big stadium or a sports arena or uh, some kind of big event hall where there were just a lot of people? Anybody? Like it was just crowds of people. How many of you like crowds? No one raises their hand on this. Okay, it's first service, the same thing. No one likes crowds. If you don't like crowds, I can understand because crowds are very stressful. Crowds can be overwhelming. It can be a lot when you are in a crowd. It can just feel like you're claustrophobic, right? You can't breathe. There's too many people. Well, several years ago, when our kids were little, my mother decided for Thanksgiving, she wanted us all to go to Disney World on Thanksgiving Day. Don't correct my information, mother. I'm right, okay? And so... Um, I'm just kidding. She knows it. And she was all excited, but we were excited about going. We hadn't been in many years. And so we were kind of pumped about being at Disney, taking the family, my three sisters, their three husbands, and all of our little kids went. And my twin sister, her baby was in a stroller. We had little toddlers that went with us, but we were excited because they were going to see Disney for the first time and very excited. And so we get there and we realize that it's very crowded, but we thought, well, you know, it'll thin out as the time goes by. I mean, can't imagine it's going to get any worse than this. It's Thanksgiving. People are eating turkey, you know, that whole thing. So we go and get on the first ride. It was probably like, it's a small world or Mr. Toad's wild ride. One of those for kids. And after we come out of the ride, we realize as we come out of the ride that it not only has not thinned out, but it's actually more crowded. And so we started to get a little nervous. How are we going to get through this crowd with all of our little kids and all of our stuff and baby, you know, diaper bags and strollers? And so we said, let's just get through this little area because there's little streets and lanes at Disney and they'll have these gates. And then as you kind of come around the corner, there'll be just a bigger, more wide open space, a bigger area. So we start powwowing and saying, let's just all figure out how to get over there. We'll meet up over there and then we'll figure out what we want to do. Well, as we kind of get into the crowd, we had to just merge in. We all get separated. I look back, my sister's literally crying because she's got the baby in the stroller and it was shoulder to shoulder trying to get through people and the crowd is now pulling me away. I've got two toddlers I'm holding on to. My husband has the other child and we're holding on for dear life trying to get through this crowd and just shoulder to shoulder, massive throng of people and it was making us nervous and it was overwhelming and we get through this crowd and... And finally, we get to what we thought would be a more open area, and we're just yelling at each other, over here, meet over there, just get your way. And literally, I had to go you know, several feet away from the direction I wanted to actually go in because the crowd was pulling me and pushing me that way. And I found that my family members were being pushed and pulled in different directions. We finally made it through to where we wanted to be, and we decided this is too dangerous. This is crazy. They, this is dangerously packed. We can't even keep track of our kid. I got somebody else's kid now. You know, that was Nicole. I just traded her out for somebody else. Yeah. I don't know where the other one is, but somebody's got them and they're doing well. And, um, and so we were just going crazy trying to get through this, this crowd. And so we finally realized there's no way. And as we got closer to Main Street, we thought, well, we'll get to Main Street. It'll get better. It got worse. It mushroomed. And we realized there's no way. This crowd, we can't get through the crowd. And this crowd is going to keep us from where we want to go. And this crowd is going to keep us from getting where we want to go at the time we want to get there. So we decided to go to guest services and demand our money back. And we had to get in line. And of course, they do the Disney thing. We'll give you tickets to come back at another time. So that's what we did. But I think it was a decade before we ever stepped foot back into Disney. But then they learned the crowd control genius that is Disney. And so we've been back since then. But that was a crazy day. Not only were, were our kids little and, and uh, we had strollers, my mother was in a wheelchair. She had broken her leg or something. So we're pushing her around in a wheelchair. So it was just not the time to be in a big crowd. So I probably just made you nervous just telling that story if you're claustrophobic about crowds. Um, but crowds are stressful. Crowds can be even dangerous, oftentimes, if we're not in the right crowd. As you 
maybe try to get through your life, the crowd can push you and pull you in a direction many times you really don't even want to go. And you'll find yourself going backwards when you're trying to go forward, sideways when you're trying to make traction. And, and you're probably not going to get where you want to go at the speed that you want to get there either. And in our culture today, in our world today, we have crowds of people talking big talk. It's like mice with microphones, right? <laughs> and the next time you look at your situation and you think that the devil's just yelling at you or your problem is just way too big, just remember the enemy is just a mice with a microphone. Okay, you need to see that that was a, that was free for y'all today. And that's what happens. We hear people that just really are mice with microphones in our world today that are that are yelling and and it's so easy to follow the crowd and many times we don't want to be people that that kind of push back against the crowd. So you we'll just kind of not say anything or we'll just go with the flow. But the reality that crowd is going to force you to go along and you may find yourself doing things you don't even really want to do or thought you would never do in your life only because that's what the crowd wants to do. And the crowd will wave a flag of celebration and it could be that that's not what you believe or they'll force you to say things you don't believe, but because you don't want to be mocked by the crowd and you don't want to be canceled by the crowd. Cancel culture is a real issue. And so to avoid it, we just go along. Jesus was very adept at crowds. And in Luke chapter 19, Jesus is talking to a crowd. When we read through the New Testament, you see Jesus understood crowds very well. And I don't want to set this stage for this chapter in Luke, Luke chapter 19. I want to, I want you to know what's happening. You know, when a, when a a verse in the middle of a chapter starts out with, um, after Jesus said this, then he, I'm like, what did he say? I need to know what he said before I keep reading. So many times I'll go back and find out what did Jesus say? Because they said, after Jesus said this in, in verse 28 of Luke chapter nine, it says he went on ahead. And so what did Jesus say? So to give you context, to set up the scene here, Jesus had just told the crowd that had formed. He had told them the, the powerful story, famous story of the parable of the talents. If you've not heard that story, go read your Bible. It's found in all of the gospels, the parable of the talents. It is a very incredible powerful story. And so Jesus had just said this. He had just told the story. We pick it up. Luke chapter 19 and verse 28. Jesus had said this, and then he went on going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever written untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Somebody just say that out loud. Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are they untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Say it again. The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And verse 38 says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The crowds begin to shout and declare, Hosanna, Hosanna, or that word also means save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is accustomed to crowds. He knows crowds very well because he has been around for the three years of his ministry. He has been around crowds while he was teaching. There was a crowd while he was preaching, while he healed and performed miracles Crowds formed. There was a crowd when he delivered his sermon on the mount. 
There was a large crowd that formed when he fed the 5,000 because we know the Bible says that he fed 5,000 men and women and then children, family members and extended family members would have been extra. They, at count, they probably figured at least 15,000 people were fed that day by Jesus. And then there was another time that Jesus fed a crowd of over 4,000 in Gentile territory. So Jesus fed, we always hear about the feeding of the 5,000, but Jesus fed 4,000 too. Jesus was a miracle worker. There was always crowds around him. That's why Zacchaeus, who was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, had to climb up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. Right? So a, a, a man named Zacchaeus actually had to climb up. The crowd was so large to see Jesus in the crowd. He drew crowds when he healed the sick. When he cast out demons, you better believe there was a crowd. Wow, that had to be an amazing crowd. When he forgave people, there was a crowd. There was a large crowd around Jesus on Palm Sunday, but that was no problem for Jesus at all. He was used to crowds, but not everyone in that crowd was there for the right reason. There was different crowds, so that means there were different motives. And you know, there are five distinct crowds that included people with five different agendas and five different motives. As a matter of fact, experts have studied crowds and crowd behavior, and they've concluded that the same type of people show up at big sporting events, at rock concerts, uh, mar marathons, parades. It's the same type of people, different types of crowds that show up at public demonstrations and even at church gatherings. There are five, at least five different groups of people in any crowd and every single one of us are part of one of those groups. So today we're going to go through a little bit of these crowds. I'm going to give you five crowds and you can decide which one you're in. I already know. I already know mine because I did this before, but I, I want you to identify, identify what crowd you are in. And there's nothing wrong with being in a crowd. Can I tell you that? There's nothing wrong. We're all in crowds, but there are some things that you should be aware of before you jump into a particular crowd. You, you got to know the reason you're in that crowd. You need to understand, ask yourself if you're in the crowd for the right reasons. Never be in the crowd just to say you're in the crowd. You know, they, they've done studies um, and, and they have found that there could be someone standing on the side of a building and they pick up a rock and they throw it and break a window. Someone else will walk up and say, why are we throwing rocks? Well, this is why someone in that building, you know, is, is dangerous or whatever the story is. And then the next person will come up and throw a rock and they'll walk up and say, well, why are we throwing rocks? Well, because this guy told me that there's somebody in this building. Said, so they pick up, they say that a few people will ask, but after a while, when a crowd forms, they'll just stop asking. People will just walk up and see people throwing rocks and they'll just pick up and start throwing rocks without even really knowing why. It's just the nature of crowds. It's human nature. And so we need to know about crowds and find out if the people in the crowd share the same beliefs as you. Make sure your mission statement lines up with other people in the crowds in your life. And there are several crowds in our lives. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want to talk about on Palm Sunday, the five different types of people, groups that followed Jesus that day in the crowd. Number one is the curious crowd. The curious crowd, there were people in the crowd that were curious. And the curious crowd, they've seen Jesus preach. They've watched him heal. They've seen him perform many miracles over a three-year per uh, year period. It's incredible. These, per these people have a curious mentality. These people are curious. They've got questions. And they followed him on Palm Sunday because they wanted to know what he was going to do. It was all about curiosity. What's Jesus going to do? We've seen him heal. We've seen him deliver. We've seen him do miracles. I wonder what he's going to do next. And they were just more curious about what, it, what was in it for them. They just wanted to be among the crowd and they went along with the crowd, just hoping to get a blessing just because they were in the crowd. There's nothing wrong with being curious. 
Up to a point, we all should be curious, but it's all right to ask questions and, and, and get answers, but it's that there comes a time when you should be able to answer those questions yourself. There's a time that you need to move beyond just hearing and start doing, getting wisdom, gaining knowledge, because there's so many foundational things you need to know that are found in the Word of God. Start in Genesis, go all the way through Revelation, and it's important that you know. Be curious, but take initiative to search the Scriptures for yourself. Know Jesus for yourself. So if you're curious, get, 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 get some knowledge right? Okay. Then another group who followed Jesus were the confused crowd. The confused crowd, we'll, we can find them in Matthew chapter 21. And Jesus asked, uh, when, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, everyone in the city was excited. This is found in Matthew 21 and verse 10. It says, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, everybody was excited and asked, who can this be? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Of all the things they'd seen Jesus do, they had a one-line description. Oh, he's the prophet. That's who they thought Jesus was. They'd followed him. They'd seen him do great things, but they were confused at who he really was. And there's a a confused group of people today, and they refer to God as the higher power, the man upstairs, They don't really know who God is. They don't understand God's word. And they say part of scripture and they just repeat cliches and they argue their point and they don't even know the context of scripture. And they do it because they're confused. The confused crowd followed Jesus while still thinking he was just a prophet. They didn't understand they were following the savior and the prince of peace. Matthew 21, I love this scripture. Uh, I'm going to read it to you in the message translation uh, because I think it really kind of clears something up for us. It says, the disciples went and did exactly what Jesus told them to do. The disciples went and did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They led the donkey and colt out. They laid some of their clothes on them and Jesus mounted. Nearly all of the people in the crowd threw their garments down on the road, giving him a royal welcome. And I love this scripture if you, because it says that, it, it says that the disciples did exactly what Jesus told them to do. If you go back to verse nine of Matthew 21, you'll see that, actually go ahead. It says crowds went ahead and crowds followed. Crowds went ahead of Jesus. Crowds went ahead of Jesus. And when I read that, I think, well, of course they did. They were just excited. Jesus was coming. They wanted to announce to the world Jesus was coming. Anybody have like announcers in your family? They're the ones that tell everybody what's happening. They're the ones that want to tell everybody what the the plans are. They can't wait to be the first one to call you. If they hear something is happening in the family, they're going to be the ones that share all of the news. We call them the people that we count on for information. Is that what we call them sometimes? Or those are the people that might just are little, they're just a little meddly. They just get, they meddle. You know what I'm saying? And I think these are, these are the people that Jesus was describing or the word describes. They were just so confused. They just got excited about the party. Jesus is coming. And they ran ahead of Jesus. The Bible is distinctive to distinguish that the disciples did exactly what Jesus told them to do. And when they did, everything Jesus told them would happen, happened. But the crowds went ahead of Jesus. When I look through scripture, Luke says, after he said these things, he was going on ahead. Jesus said some things and he said, I'm going on ahead. Matthew said, after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. We see that each gospel is descriptive of what Jesus did. Jesus said um, in Matthew 27, go quickly, tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. Mark 16, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you. There you will see him just as he told you. This speaks to me that Jesus goes first and we follow. Jesus goes ahead. Can I tell you, if you're not following Jesus, if you're running out ahead of him, no wonder you're confused. No wonder we don't know which way to go. No wonder we can't break out of the crowds and the voices of the people in our head. And, and, and because we're running out ahead, we can get so 
fixated on things that aren't changing and aren't moving and and I just want to I just want to see things change and we can actually put ourselves into a state of confusion only because we did not wait on Jesus. Jesus will give you the command. He'll say you go. As a matter of fact, cuz I've I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. Jesus goes first and we follow. Amen. That just that just helped somebody today. I hope that helped you. If you're confused, Maybe I'm moving out ahead too quick. God, maybe I need to step back. Maybe I just need to watch in wonder. At what? Je- How about Jesus is capable? Yes. How about he's big enough? He knows what's ahead. Yes. How about he knows? All I need to do is stay right by his side. How about I just wait for him to give the next command? I'm not missing a thing by running out ahead of him. I want to stand right by his side and just be the one waving the palm branches. I'm going to stay in a place of worship and praise because Jesus is in the room. I don't need to run ahead. I don't need to get ahead of Jesus. All I need to do is stay where I'm at, stay next to him, stay with him, keep my eyes on him, stay out of confusion. Amen. And then the number, number three, the pretenders. There were pretenders in the crowd that day, and they were pretending to be committed to Christ. They were pretending, but they weren't fully sold out. They, they were going through the motions. Their hearts were lukewarm. They really weren't in or out. It was just the exciting thing for the day, and they were pretending to follow Christ. They wanted to impress people. Pretenders, that's really what they want to do. They just want to impress people, and they want to get other people's approval. But they've got people fooled. Abraham Lincoln said it, uh, said it best when he said, you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And we should add to that, you can't fool God anytime, right? So you might as well just be real. Look at somebody and say, be real. Just be real. Jesus loves you and be real. There's nothing else you could do to make Jesus love you more. So just accept it and be real. Just be real. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to come in all super saved. Come in and say, you know what? I'm broken. I'm hurting. I'm wounded. I need help. I need somebody to help me. And don't pretend. God knows. And then there were the opposers. There were people in that day that were opposers like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Jewish religious leaders. And for three years, they had done everything they could to oppose Jesus. Everything they could to discredit him. They rebuked him for everything. Jesus couldn't do anything right. When religious people are around, that's just how they are. This is the way it is. They rebuked him for healing on the Sabbath. He healed somebody, but it was on the Sabbath. You broke a rule. We don't do that. And he was rebuked. They rebuked him for taking an ox out of the ditch. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. They rebuked him because his disciples ate food without washing their hands. They just were critical. They, they just were, they were fault finders and they were in the crowd on Palm Sunday. And there are Pharisees and Sadducees among us today. And there are people who challenge God and they challenge the people of God. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they tried to trip Jesus up. They look for things to debate and argue about. That's really what they were all about. They just wanted to argue and they were, and they were people who never see anything good in a situation. Can you imagine? Here you are with Jesus, the son of God. Even if you don't believe he's the son of God, what are you going to do with the miracles that you've watched? him perform? What are you going to do with the way he fed 5,000 with the crowds following him? You should at least be a little impressed, <laughs> right? And, and they, 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 were, they, could, they couldn't see it. I, I can't imagine that they would not have been impacted by him. But if Jesus had opposers, can I tell you, you're going to have opposers. If Jesus had to fight religious people and people that are just rule followers and we do it this way, well, then you're going to have to fight that as well. And because there are people, they're going to see the bad in every uh, situation. They're never going to see the good and they're going to have a problem for every solution. Yes. (laughs) You might work with some of those people. You might live with someone like that, but they just are. They just, if there, if there is a solution, they're going to find a problem with it. That's just how they are. They're going to pick things out that are just, it's like, okay, you can't overlook that. You know, my husband pastor, well, he's pastoring now, but he was a home builder for 15 years. 
And he just trained himself to find every little, after he would build the house, you, they would go through it with blue tape. Any home builders in the house? You go through any, if you build a house, blue tape. And blue tape was where you would, you would put a little piece of blue tape where there was what they call a holiday, which means that was a place the painters missed. That was a place that somehow the framers didn't get and it's off center. That's where it kind of is not right. Right here we measured it and the tile is not laid right. And so you would put a little piece of blue tape there so that when the, the, the people came in to fix it, they would know what to fix. And there would be days that they would walk in, the workers would walk in and there was blue tape everywhere. <laughs> like there was more blue tape than house. And that was on Monday. He eased up after that. But that was how it was. And he just learned how to pick out flaws. And then after about 15 years, I'm like, that's cool. That's great at work, but don't bring that home. Don't bring that home. Okay. I don't have blue tape on my forehead. Okay. And we, we do. And it, over, over the years, he's had to actually work at that to not walk in pointing. That's wrong. That's off. Like, but you, honestly, that, that, that can become something that we've got to overcome and, and not become that person that maybe it's not even in your heart. It's just become a habit that you just see what's wrong first. You just take, make a list of everything that's wrong. Cause I'll tell you, if you're one of those people, you know, you're, you're not going to find yourself blessed. A lot of the times that I find that people are the most critical, the ones that complain about the most, they are the most mean spirited people. They're the most hurtful people, and they'd rather complain nothing's good enough. And there are people in the crowd when Jesus came by, that that's who they were, and they had that front row seat. And instead of being excited that Jesus, the Son of God, was making a triumphal entry, and they should have humbled them, that should have made them awestruck. They should have hit their knees. Instead, they say, it's too hot. We didn't get any hummus. Tell me you brought some hummus. Please, it's, and why did Jesus pick a donkey? Seriously? How long is this going to take? I was told this processional would we'd be in and out, in and out, in and out. I don't understand. He's on a donkey, and this is going to take forever. I've got a, I got a whole stable filled with horses. He could have asked me. Nobody asked me for what I offered. Now he's on, now I got it. And, and instead of seeing the power and magnificence of the Son of God and the moment that was happening and playing out prophetically right in front of them. There were people that just thought it's too much. They put their cloaks down on the road. Well, who is he? He's not a celebrity. That's too much. That's what they would do. They'd throw their, their cloaks down whenever they were signifying a dignitary or a celebrity coming into Jerusalem. And I would bet you there were people that opposed everything they saw Jesus doing that day. And they were trying to tear down God's people, just like, just like people do today. It happens all around us. And then there's the committed crowd. The committed crowd is the last group, and it's the smallest group. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is. It's the, most, it's the one that most people say they're in. That's the one. I'm in the committed group. However, it is the smallest. And committed followers do exactly what Jesus told them to do. They are, you know, people who follow Jesus' instruction. Whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. I'm serving. I'm in church. I'm here. I, I don't even question. I don't have any other motivation. I don't murmur. I don't complain. Whatever Jesus says, I'm going to do it. That's who I, who I want to be. And and this is what I love about Matthew 21. The disciples left and did exactly what Jesus told them to do. And they followed Jesus wholeheartedly. That's what committed crowd people do. And I want to ask you a question today. Who are you in that crowd? Who are you in the crowd? Are you the one that's a little curious? Are you confused? Are you a pretender? Are you an opposer? Are you committed? Wherever you are in the crowd, I think it's important that you and I understand God wants us to grow, to move forward. You know, it's interesting because you need to understand crowds in your own life. You have a lot of different crowds in your life. You have the crowd of your family, the crowd of your spouse. You've got the crowd, people speaking things to you that could literally move you and change you and, and, and shape you. You've got the crowd of, of your coworkers. 
You've got the crowd of your church. There are, there are things all around you that you can just get thrown in a crowd and then you realize how emotional and fickle crowds are. Crowds love you one day and they hate you the next. Crowds are building you up one day and then they're taking you down and building and pushing you down the next. Jesus understood crowds. As a matter of fact, I feel like Jesus was just ready because it says he made his entry on Friday and he went straight to the temple and he started throwing the money changers out. He started throwing out all the religious people that had been taking money and, and, and misusing money. And the Jews, the Christian Jews were so tired. They were fed up with seeing what was happening in the temple. And now finally, somebody's coming to set the record straight. Not only that, he's going to kick them out. And so the crowd, Jesus is on fire. They're so excited. Man, nobody's talked to the Sadducees like that. Nobody has, has come up and challenged the religious leaders like that. And he's making a difference. People are getting out. He, did you see what Jesus did? He went up and threw out the chickens, went flying. <laughs> Coins and change went flying. He didn't even care. Man, did y'all see it? Somebody tell me you got that on tape. Somebody, did somebody get that? And, and so he's so excited. He's cleansing the temple. The, the, temple, the crowd loved it. And they, and, and they grew. They loved it when they watched Jesus outwit the Jewish leaders and the elders they loved watching. Okay, y'all, did you hear? Okay, we were here yesterday, and he took that guy on that thinks he knows everything. You just wait. Wait till you hear what Jesus does. And so crowds just kept forming. Three times, three times the Bible says that they, the Jewish leaders tried to uh, trap Jesus. They tried to trip him up with something that they didn't think he would know. And every time, Jesus relentlessly beat them, outwitted them, and, they, and he, they were humiliated when they tried to humiliate him. So I can tell you, there was no Netflix, okay? There was, there, there was no cable TV, which, what is that anymore? There was no YouTube. Everybody is down at the temple watching what Jesus is doing. So the crowd is getting bigger. Jesus is becoming more popular. The crowd is gaining intensity and, and the crowd is just pushing and, and they're getting more and more excited and they're happy and they're finally celebrating, smiling, hoping, but there were religious people in that crowd that day. And how is it that just within a few days, a crowd of people that were smiling, dancing, leaping, honoring, praising, hoping that this was the Messiah, four days later, they were threatening, taunting, criticizing, screaming, demanding his death. That same crowd that once celebrated Jesus is now demanding his crucifixion. See, crowds are fickle. You got to know who's in that crowd. You need to know who's leading you, shaping you. You need to make sure that whoever's in the crowd in your life and in your ear is leading you in the right direction. Jesus, can I tell you? Jesus was undaunted by the crowd. He was unmoved by the crowd. He just wouldn't go their way. He was going to do it his way. And as a result, the whole world is different. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And there's one who is undaunted by the crowd, and that is Jesus. He's not moved by the masses. He's not moved by cancel culture. You can't cancel Jesus. Why? Why was Jesus undaunted by the crowd? First, he knew who he was. Jesus knew who he was. He was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. He was the Messiah. Jesus knew he was a different kind of king. He knew he was the one of whom Zechariah prophesied about. He was secure in the knowledge of who he was. He was the Prince of Peace. He was the Son of God. Jesus rode into that donkey knowing he was Emmanuel, that he was, he was deliverer. He knew that he was the Lamb. Jesus was the light of the world. Jesus was the Word of God. Jesus knew who he was. Do you? Do you know who you are? You'll be moved by crowds if you don't know who you are. You'll be moved by other voices if you don't know who God says you are. The answer to that is you're created in the image of God. Colossians 2 says, I'm complete in him who is the head over all and rule and authority of my life. Ephesians says, I'm alive with Christ. That's who you are. First Peter says, I am chosen. 
I'm the one who God called. He called me out of darkness of sin and he called me into light so that I can proclaim the excellence and greatness of who he is. That's who I am. First Peter says, I'm born again. He says, I'm spiritually transformed. I've been renewed. I'm set apart for God's purpose through the living and everlasting word of God. Ephesians says, I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. See, if you know who you are, you will be undaunted by the crowd. Unmoved, unshakable. And, and here's why Jesus was unmoved by the crowd. Also, he could accept praise without his head being turned by praise. See, this is so important because Jesus understood to receive the hosannas with humility. He knew that they were going to be short-lived and he could see through the crowd. He could see beyond what the crowd was screaming and yelling. He knew who the plotters were. He knew who the religious people were. He knew that there were people in the crowd who were waiting for a better day just to get him. He could identify the majority of the people who love the parade. They love to shoot off fireworks, whatever you hand to them. And he also knew the people that would be there in good times and bad. See, Jesus saw through the crowd. In times past, we, hear, we read where Jesus said, as such is the kingdom of heaven. That's probably why he trusted children more than anything. Because they were real. See, you, you got to understand how to accept praise without your head being turned by praise. If you meet somebody that's a praiser, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. And their heart might be totally pure and right. You just got to be careful. Don't let your head be turned by praise and you start believing that. You put your trust in God. Years ago, when we would be going to conferences, even now, or concerts, and I would be singing, you know, doing a concert at the end with, with several other artists that were on the ticket as well. At the end of the night, I would be at our merch table, and there would be people waiting in line to get an autograph. And inherently, there'd be somebody, inherently, inherently, that's for the, the music, that's for the edit, inherently, there would be somebody that would come up to me, and they would say, oh, I have just been waiting in this long line because I want to get your autograph. And I've just got to tell you, your music has changed me. You are my favorite gospel artist. I pro you're my favorite songwriter. You're my favorite singer. I just, and they'll just be gushing, gushing, gushing. And I, in the beginning, I would say, I am. Oh my God. I didn't realize I am better than I think. I, I just don't think highly of myself enough. And, and I would just get so excited. And then eventually I would realize if I waited long enough, that same person who blew my head up would be telling the next gospel artist at their table, you are my favorite. I just think you're incredible. And I realized don't trust people who are, not that you don't trust them, but don't just take them at face value. There are people, they're just encouragers. That's their gift. And they'll get excited. We, we used to call it green room talk. Oh, you're coming to my church. I'm going to have you at my church. Well, I can't wait. To, and none of it means anything. I mean, it's just people are encouraging. And we got to be careful. Jesus was that. If it means something, they'll reach out. But other than that, let it go in one ear and let it go out the other and just say, thank you, Jesus. And as praise is coming your way, just get low and just say, Jesus, all the glory goes to you. Thank you, because if, if you can't handle the hosannas, you won't be able to handle the hatred. Jesus could handle the hosannas because he could handle the hatred. He could look through eyes of pity and love at the crowd who was being driven by their emotions. They were, they were driven by how they were feeling and they lacked understanding. They didn't understand what was happening because they didn't know who he was. And not only did he suffer the mocking and the jeers of the crowd who had just shouted, I love you, Jesus, Hosanna, you're amazing. He also had to to deal with the betrayal of close friends. That's hard to take. Listen, you got to accept abuse without being destroyed by it. Your kids are going to do stuff that might crush you. Your spouse is going to, is going to make decisions that might hinder you, that might frustrate you. Your boss, your pastor, there, there probably will be in your life a crushing that comes. But will you be moved by it? Will you be destroyed by it? Jesus knew he could not be destroyed by abuse that was coming his way. He knew he had to stand up for what was right because he knew he was right. 
Jesus could face the mocking of the crowd. He could face the praise of the crowd because he knew he was right. And he didn't turn with the crowd when the crowd began to turn. See, we, we, many times we'll turn when the crowd begins to turn. And when the crowd's values shift, we begin to shift with our values. But I'm telling you, church, we've got to stand up and hold to our core values today now more than ever. Jesus stayed on mission when he faced abuse and indifference. He didn't even stop to throw a pity party. He just kept going and he didn't even take time to enjoy the moment of the cheering crowd. He just was on mission. He was focused. He had a laser approach focused to his mission and what he was called to do. And that's what committed people do. It's called faithfulness because one day, we can, we can throw off the crowd. We can see through the emotions of the crowd because one day we want to stand up and hear Jesus say, well done. Well done. That's what faithfulness is all about. Jesus didn't allow that immediate applause, applause to get in the way of the pain of the cross. He knew that he was going to have to fulfill the task because it wasn't just about what he had done up until that moment. He had a task. The empty tomb is what he saw. He saw the ascension. He saw his ultimate second coming. Do you see the ultimate task that God has given you? And are you fulfilling that? Are we allowing the crowd orchestrate us into doing its will? Is it possible to not be moved by the crowd? Listen, is it possible to not be moved by another voice in our world? Is it possible when we face misunderstanding and betrayal and pain from others? Is it, can we stay faithful to God even when the world has abused us? Can we? Fa- yes, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. But here's how it's possible. You've got to ask the, in, the important question. And the important question is not, was, is not what does God think? The, the, important, edit. the important question that you and I need to ask today is not what the crowd thinks, but what does Jesus think? So we can so easily be concerned with what people think that we forget to ask, what does Jesus think? And that's the most important question. Not what the crowd thinks, not what my spouse thinks, not what my kids think, not what everybody else thinks. Jesus, what is it that you think? The best way to be undaunted by the crowd is to walk with the king. Somebody give God the praise. You gotta walk with the king. You got to walk with the king. You have to look to him. He is everything that you need. He's your provider. He is your supply. You don't need to look to the people around you for guidance, for leadership, any of those things before you look to Jesus, before you look to him. Because there are crowds all around us and they love the idea of Jesus, but they don't always love the authority of Jesus. They, they, they want Jesus, the great teacher, but not Jesus, the, the, the one asking for the keys to their lives. I want the deliverer, but I don't want that one that asked me to submit my life to his kingship. And those are the people in the crowd. There's a lot of people today and they're in that crowd. We want Jesus that makes us celebrate when I think of the goodness of God and all that he's done for me. And, and, but Jesus, I'm not going to put you first. When I think about all the things you've done, but I'm not going to make going to church a priority. I'm not going to do what you've asked me to do first because I don't have that much time in my schedule to really serve. I've got too much going on. I got too many of my own problems. Can I, can I help you today a little bit? I hope I've helped you a little bit. I'm going to wrap this up if that's okay. I want to encourage you today because if you identify with any of these crowds, I want to help you take your next step. Is that all right? And, and, and so here's the thing. I, I want to just pray for those in the room that are are curious and maybe you're curious i would encourage you to get to know god's word if you're curious if you've been coming to church you've been kind of kicking the tires looking around maybe you've been watching some things on youtube or watching td jakes joyce meyer somebody like that and it's really starting to make sense to you and you're curious i would encourage you to read god's word because you're going to find every answer every solution you need in god's word 
So move from curiosity. And I pray that even today, you're going to find that Jesus is the way, He's the truth, and He is the life. And so if you're confused today, aren't you glad I'm not asking you to raise your hand? I would never do that. But if you're confused, I want you to take this advice, the advice of the wisest man who ever lived. His name was Solomon. And you can find him in the book of Proverbs. He said, in all you're getting, get understanding. So you can be reading your Bible and say, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Well, it's our responsibility to get understanding, whether that's coming to church and hearing a preached word that helps you understand God's word more, or if it's getting the version app out every day, go through Proverbs. I promise you, if you read a Proverbs a day, you won't be confused. If you read a Proverbs a day, you will get understanding and then live by what Paul said. He says, what so in Philippians, being transformed by the renewing of your mind and whatever is pure, whatever is just, whatever is true, whatever is lovely of good report, think on these things. That's going to keep you from being confused. And then for the pretenders, my prayer for you today is that you're just going to get real and be yourself. Be who God has made you to be. You are made in the image of God. You can't do anything else that God won't love you any more than he does right now. Just let him love you. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Isn't that good news? And then the opposers, I want to say to the people that just struggle with complaining and fault finding, just know that complaining and murmuring will just block your blessing It'll just block your blessing. The children of Israel, they wandered for 40 years when they could have gotten to promised land in 11 days. God provided for them. God got them where they needed to go, but took them a lot longer because they followed the crowd. I encourage you that you'll just stop opposing. Start loving people. Forgive people. Get along with people. Look for the good in people. For those of you who are committed. I pray today that you're going to even get more committed and go that extra mile. Where do I need to be? Where do you need me? I'm not going to just go to church. I want to serve. I want to be that person that's consistent in serving God and giving him everything. And then first Corinthians is your prayer. I'm praying this for you, that you will always be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, your work is not in vain. That's my prayer for the committed people in the room. And I want to pray for you today because there's new, there's good news on this Palm Sunday. Y'all, there's good news on Palm Sunday. This is not bad news. This is, there is one crowd that we should all want to be in. Just one crowd. And that's the crowd that's going to be caught up with Jesus in the air. I'm ready for that. I'm ready for Jesus. He's coming back to take us home. That's the crowd I want to be in because Jesus is coming back for one large crowd. There'll be no more curious people. There'll be no more confused people, no more pretenders, no more opposers. Jesus is returning for the committed ones who have confessed that Jesus is Lord. That's who Jesus is coming back. Can you give God some praise this morning? I want to pray for you today. If you'd, I'm going to ask if you would close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment. If you're here today, I've prayed for already, and I'm continuing to pray for all of you in the room. Maybe you identify with one of these crowds, and I'm just believing that God is going to take you and, and bring you to a, a place of understanding and move you another step closer to a relationship with Him. Wherever you fall in that c- category, whoever you identify in these crowds, God is saying, I see you. I see you. There's conviction there. And God's going to begin to move you to that place where you are committed to him. As a believer, we want to be committed to him, not moved by crowds, not moved by voices, not moved by who's going where and what's happening. And, and then we end up not getting where we really wanted to go. And, and that happens when we're not surrendered to Jesus. If you're in this room today and you, and, and you would say, that's me. I've never really surrendered my life to Christ. Maybe you're watching online and you would say, I've never really made Jesus the head or the Lord of my life. Can I tell you that Jesus, as you pray with me today, the records of the saying, the final sayings of Jesus on the cross is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
when five days earlier that we call Palm Sunday, when people crowded the streets of Jerusalem shouting Hosanna in the highest, just a few days later they were shouting crucify him and his response to their outcry on the cross was Father forgive them. He understood the bloodthirsty people that were all around his feet. They just didn't understand. And so he was able to take on a relentless beating and mocking torture of the cross. But it was his forgiveness that he issued in the midst of that torment to a lost crowd. And that same gift of forgiveness reaches to you today. Comes to you today. See, all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of living a perfect life. But today we have the hope of forgiveness. I want to encourage you today to receive the gift that Jesus offers today. Forgiveness will break the power of every sin. The forgiveness of Jesus, no matter where you are, no matter what you've been, where you've been, no matter what you've done, forgiveness will reach down. The love of Jesus will reach down beyond hurts, beyond regret, beyond failure. And Jesus forgives you and he loves you unconditionally. If there's anyone in this room, anyone watching online, and you would say, man, would you just pray for me? I want that forgiveness of sins. I want to be committed to Christ. Would you raise your hand? If there's anyone in this room today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I need forgiveness of sin. I need to walk in righteousness. Thank you, Father. I want us to pray this prayer all together. Pray it out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, today I surrender to you. I believe you have forgiven me of all of my sins. God, today I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again. Today I receive new life that you have made available through your victory over death. Change me, Lord. Shape me into the person you have made me to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can you celebrate today? Let's celebrate lives changed. Come on, new life, new life. Would you stand with me all over this room and let's give God just a, just give him a few seconds of worship and praise. Come on, if you are blessed today, let's worship God. Amen.